Hi, everyone. Welcome to October's virtual lecture. Uh, my name is Carla Gonzalez, and I'd like to introduce you to our speaker today, Toma Campain. Um, <laughs> you will show how to include water bodies in gravity and magnetic inversion modeling using geoscience analyst pro-geophysics. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please don't hesitate to type them into the Q&A. And a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and it's gonna be available in our YouTube channel in the coming days. Um, so that's it for the intro. Um, whenever you are ready, Tomah. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Kata. So uh, thanks everyone for uh, uh, joining us today for this, uh, this virtual lecture. So uh, we'll be talking uh, about including water bodies in, uh, in uh, gravity and uh, magnetic uh, inversion uh, modeling. Uh, water bodies are not always explicitly uh, represented in uh, inversion modeling. So we'll see today uh, how to do that with gravity data. Uh, we won't be using uh, magnetic data, um, but the workflow and the processes uh, will remain uh, the same. We'll be using uh, Geoscience Analyst Pro Geophysics, um, current and upcoming uh, utilities, some of which uh, Carla will, uh, uh, will mention uh, after, uh, after the talk. So let's go and uh, look uh, at our data. So here on the screen now, you can see uh, our uh, Geoscience Analyst uh, workspace. And we already have like uh, some data displayed here. So we can see an airborne survey here, which is um, a publicly available um, uh, NRCAN um, survey located in uh, St. George's Bay in uh, Newfoundland. So it's in Southwestern uh, Newfoundland. And you can see that uh, something really interesting with um, uh, that survey. So we can see here the, the footprint is that the survey actually is really kind of in a hybrid environment where it encroaches onshore on the edges and in the St. George Bay here in the middle where we can see the, the bathymetry, uh, we have like water depth of up to uh, 150 meters. So it, it's really a challenging modeling environment because we know that we have a sizable body of seawater right here in the middle and that we have, um, uh, you know, seawater and, uh, and the topography. So, um, the shore that's just around the survey here. So um, what we'll be using today so is um, uh, the data from this uh, uh, airborne uh, gravity gravimetry survey that was uh, acquired in uh, 2012 uh, by Bell Geospace. Um, we have uh, uh, some information about uh, the surface geology uh, of the base. I'm using like pre-saved views here to just quickly load objects. We've got this map of St. George's Bay here. And I, I kept this map because it's quite uh, interesting. It has uh, a cross section here that we can see traced here and located here at the, the lower uh, right of the of the map. And um, uh, what I've done is to actually, uh, I located that cross section directly here uh, in 3D. So that will help us actually to uh, uh, maybe analyze uh, the model um, further down this, uh, this talk. Um, what else we have is also uh, the bathymetry data. So uh, we started um, by showing you the actual uh, bathymetry surface, but here we can now see uh, the two uh, bathymetry data sets that were used. Uh, we were using um, the global uh, JEPCO um, 400 meter resolution bathymetry grid and topography. Uh, here with more the uh, cold to warm colors. And here with more the blue to uh, white brown elevation colors is the NRCAN um, non navigational 100 meter resolution uh, bathymetry data. So we combine these two um, data sets into uh, a single surface uh, that is in, uh, that is shown here. So now that we have um, a good overview uh, of the data, uh, I will actually um, dive into the, the actual modeling. So our modeling area that's shown here uh, will encompass uh, the survey footprint and uh, the extents. Uh, we've got a slight buffer around it. Uh, just to keep things manageable within the duration of this talk, I've um, chosen a, quite a coarse resolution here of uh, two kilometer uh, along east, west, and north, south. Uh, 
so with two kilometer resolution, knowing that the survey itself has a 400 meter line spacing and has a, a nominal ground clearance uh, of 80 uh, meters above, uh, above ground or, or water level. Uh, so the first step is going to um, downsample um, our high resolution uh, survey data to the coarser resolution uh, of our model. So to do that, I will uh, interpolate uh, the data on our grid. So uh, we'll do a minimum curvature gridding here, source object, that's the data. And for the properties here, I'll select only three properties from the entire um, provided database. One of it being the GPS altimeter, which is the elevation at which the, um, the gravity data were acquired. And then in all the tensor components here, I will select two components. One is uh, the vertical component of the gravity uh, tensor uh, that has been um, free air corrected and denoised. And then the second uh, field that I'm going to choose is to actually uh, take the vertical component of the gravity field that has been derived from the, from the tensor. And that one is also the uh, free air uh, corrected. Uh, so I've got these three properties. I will interpolate them with a search radius of one kilometer. So now on my grid, I've got uh, three properties. I've got uh, the elevation. So I'll remove the grid, remove uh, the transparency here, and I'll hide uh, our database. So here on the top view, we've got our um, uh, GPS elevation from the, the aircraft. Uh, we've got the free air um, data. So the vertical component of the gravity field uh, derived from, the, from the, um, uh, the tensor data. And here we have the vertical component uh, of the tensor. So now that we have our data, they're gridded and they're not located, fully located in, in 3D per se. So to do that, I will go through um, a little process that first consists of uh, creating a surface from this data. And what I'll do is I'll create a surface from which the X, Y location of the nodes are uh, based on the center of the cells of that grid. And the vertical uh, position of these nodes is based on the uh, GPS elevation property. And I'll name uh, this surface uh, St. George's Bay, uh, two kilometer data. All right. So uh, now I've got uh, a surface here with um, just uh, the GPS elevation on it, but this surface is properly located in, in 3D now. What I will need to do now is to actually transfer my free air uh, gravity properties uh, to that surface. And I will use transfer data. And I will transfer uh, data between object, uh, between my source object, which is my grid. And I'll select my two properties here. And the destination object, which is my surface. And it will be an association on the nodes of the, of the surface. There we go. So now if I hide the grid, and uh, we look uh, at our surface here in 3D. We've got um, the free air data of the vertical component uh, of the gravity field. And then we have the vertical component uh, of the tensor here uh, for, uh, for corrected. Um, it's just here the interpolation is done on the, uh, on the triangulated surface mesh. So giving it that aspect that's uh, uh, not easy on the eye, I would say. So the last step of our process now is to actually just extract uh, the nodes uh, from that surface. So it's interesting to make two kilometer data points. So now on these points, we've got the probably located in 3D we have our gravity data and our elevation here. 
So what we'll do now is that uh, now that we have our uh, data uh, that will be used for uh, our modeling, uh, we'll go ahead and actually uh, build, um, uh, build our model. So to build our model, uh, we'll be using um, the topography, the bathymetry, and um, an artificial surface flat, uh, flat elevation located at minus 10 kilometers of elevation that will define the base uh, of our model. And to build this, I will use the VP uh, model designer. And I will um, uh, first define the extents and resolution of the model. And I will do it based exactly as um, the TD grid. So we've got no, uh, I selected the 2D grid here just to get the same extents and origin and resolution. Uh, then I will select my topography, which is uh, here. So the topography does not include the, the bathymetry. So it's at, it's at uh, zero um, elevation above, um, above the seawater. And then the surfaces that will actually define the, um, the various um, domains to be built in the model are uh, my bathymetry here that's uh, clipped to the shoreline and uh, that base of model at minus 10k. So only two surfaces. I uh, do not want to uh, interpolate uh, the surface to fill holes or to extrapolate them because they cover, fully cover the extents uh, of the model. And I will name my model uh, St. George's Bay, two kilometer um, bedrock bedrock model, and it will be initially a homogeneous model. So we'll only have a, a homogeneous physical property for each uh, of the domains in that uh, represented uh, in that model. There we go. So I'll just bring this to the side here. And uh, I will hide uh, the grid with the data. And uh, now we have our uh, VP model that's displayed here. So something that's quite interesting with the, the VP models is that right now we have a, a model that uh, we've discretized actually the information from um, the topography, the bathymetry surface, and our base of model at minus 10k here into a, into a model. So if I show the grid of the model, we can see that we have uh, the same horizontal discretization and resolution as on the grid, but along the vertical, you can see that each prism is only subdivided along the vertical based on its intersection with the topography, then its intersection with the bathymetry, and its intersection with the model base at minus 10 kilometer. So along the vertical, we really have an, um, an adaptive mesh to, to really capture the variations of the, of the surface. Um, if I look here in the data colors uh, for the unit names uh, of this model, I can quickly just rename that uh, to give them like a slightly better name. Um, bedrock here. Um, so what we can see here as well is that if I display an ISO value up units and I want to see the seawater. So here we actually see the entire volume of seawater represented in the model. So that's explicitly represented into a, into a model. So right now we just have been um, uh, talking about the rock code and like the, the actual uh, geological uh, domains uh, of this model. And uh, we can now look at more of the physical property side of it uh, because it has not yet been uh, initialized. So uh, here we've got a property column that I'm going to rename to uh, density. Oops. Uh, and we want to evaluate maybe this model with a, a couple different densities for the bedrock. So we'll do one evaluation at 2.2 um, grams per cc. And the next one will be at 2.67 uh, grams per cc. So I just renamed that column here and I'll specify for the seawater uh, 1.03 grams per cc. And here for the bedrock, 2.2. And the VP basement, which is everything below um, minus 10 kilometer of elevation with the same value. So I'm essentially creating a, a terrain model um, 
with uh, where the subsurface is a homogeneous uh, density of 2.2 uh, grams per cc. Uh, I can also add an additional uh, density uh, column to uh, this table by clicking add a column. Uh, density uh, to 67. There we go. And here as well, I'll for the seawater, I'll give it 1.03 and 2.67 here for the bedrock and 2.67 here for the VP basement. So the unit that's down below here. So now we have a model where uh, each cell within that model uh, has been attributed with a rock code. So it belongs to a geological entity and uh, um, it has been attributed with uh, physical properties uh, as well. So now the next step is going to compute the response uh, uh, of this model. So to do that, I will go here and I'll compute the forward model uh, using uh, gravity. So we'll use the, the um, uh, estimated vertical component of the gravity field. Our gravity data points here, it's the points, uh, the down sample points we've created. Our data is the free or corrected data, but of the vertical component uh, of the gravity field derived from the tensor. Uh, I'll select our model here. So homogeneous model, the property selected here is the one at uh, 2.2 grams per cc. Uh, I'll specify the value of the half space, which is all the space surrounding our model area, where uh, that half space has a given elevation and a single physical property. And here, I don't want to create any contrast or edge effects due to that. So I will set um, the half space uh, density at 2.2 grams per cc and its top elevation at zero. My forward model will be FM220, that's his name. And I'll just run the forward modeling. Okay, so the forward modeling uh, just completed here. Now I can run it for the density at 2.67. I'll just update the half space value here and the name of the computed data. There we go. And uh, now I will look at our data points. And here we can see we've got the computed data and the residual data, which consists uh, of our observed uh, data minus uh, the model response. So I'll just go add a top view here. And I'll just adjust a little bit the color range for this data. We and we did right. have a question that I tried to answer during the, the time off. Of but, course. And the question is, are you able to model the actual ground based on core samples? Uh, the actual ground based on core samples. Uh, I, I'm not sure I fully understand the, the question because from the core samples, you would get, uh, well, the lithology and, um, and maybe the physical property. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and it dep depends also on the distribution of your core samples. So do you want to try to model, to create a geological model from these core samples? Uh, then it's a more complex process. And, uh, but um, uh, in the inversion process here uh, and the inversion workflow that we're going through, uh, you cannot directly uh, build a geological model from the, from the core samples. It's not a, an automated process like this. So I hope that that, that answers the question. <laughs> All right, sounds good. And uh, sorry, tomorrow I'll, I'll let you continue. <laughs> So um, would you, uh, I'm not sh exactly sure when I dropped. So I was running the Ford model and discussing the data. So um, uh, was it right then or um, did I? I think so. <laughs> okay, so, um, so through the forward modeling process, we uh, computed the response um, uh, R4 model uh, onto our data points. And um, what I wanted to bring your attention on is the actual uh, residual data here. And these residual data, so it's our free air uh, observed uh, data, uh, minus the response of the model. And the response of the model, it's the gravity response of the volume of water and of the terrain 
uh, uh, set at 2.2 grams per cc. So that residual data is actual the complete Bouguet corrected, bathymetry corrected, and Turing corrected uh, uh, data that we're looking at. So here we've got that complete Bouguet at 2.2 grams per cc, and here we've got the one at 2.67 grams per cc. So that's uh, that's uh, already creating such a model is already a good tool for like uh, terrain corrections of, uh, of gravity data. So now that we have our, uh, our model, um, we need to actually prep it, um, prepare it a little bit further um, for uh, to be usable for a heterogeneous inversion where we're trying to actually solve for the, the 3D distribution of density uh, within that uh, bedrock domain. And in order to do that, well, um, uh, will actually uh, introduce heterogeneities within the bedrock uh, green domain here. And we'll use a VP utility to create a heterogeneous unit. So currently in the model, we've got um, the cell interfaces along the vertical are explicitly represented by um, um, lithological contacts or by the bathymetry and, and topography. Now we're going to try to introduce an artificial subselling within uh, the bedrock domain. So I'll select bedrock domain here. Uh, vertical cell size 100 meter. I'll have an expansion rate of 20% along the vertical. And the output model will be bedrock model heterogeneous. So I've got a new model here. And that new model uh, if we look at the units, so it's the exact same units as before. But now if we look at the grid on the model, we can see that we have that, we introduced that vertical artificial discretization within the bedrock domain. And um, the water, uh, the seawater domain is, uh, is still a homogeneous domain. So this one will, uh, won't be able, um, used in the heterogeneous inversion, but its response uh, gravity response will be uh, taken into account. So uh, now the uh, next thing that needs to be added is uh, depth weighting onto my bottle. So the depth weighting will be used, uh, will be applied to that bedrock unit. Okay, weights are updated. I know I can look at the weights here. So I got the weights that are only applied to, um, uh, to the bedrock heterogeneous units. So there is no depth weighting applied to the homogeneous units and the, the seawater here. One other thing that we have not yet um, added to our model is that we'll need to specify upper and lower density bounds uh, for um, our model. So uh, we'll specify uh, lower bounds by adding a column here and upper bounds by adding uh, another column here. Um, for the seawater, uh, we don't want to actually uh, this to partake in any inversion uh, whatsoever. So upper and lower bounds are the same densities. Uh, for the lower bounds, uh, we could go for like very loose sediments or unconsolidated sediments at 1.8. Uh, here and with um, an upper bound of uh, 3.5, let's say, and here the same. Uh, eight. Uh, it's very generous bound, uh, bounds here, so density bounds for the, the inversion. So now that I have uh, my model with uh, depth weighting, I've got um, geological domains, uh, I've got uh, densities, starting densities for these domains and upper and lower bounds uh, for each of these um, physical properties, uh, I will be able to actually uh, go and run uh, my inversion. So I'm going into the geophysics menu. Um, I will select heterogeneous uh, inversion. And uh, for data, this time I'll use the gravity uh, graduometry data directly. I'll select my two kilometer resampled data points. Um, uh, the uncertainty level will be at 0 0.4 uh, edvals. The gradiometry type, here you can see we can choose between Falcon and Bell. 
because they've got slightly different um, uh, tensor components. Uh, so for the belt data, we only select the vertical component of the tensor uh, that is uh, denoised and free or corrected. Uh, the output name of the uh, inversion will be uh, HT for heterogeneous inversion, and we'll use the starting density of 2.67 for the, uh, the bedrock. Then I'll go into the model panel and specify uh, uh, the model to be used for this inversion. So I'll select uh, my heterogeneous model. Uh, the property, the starting density will be 2.67. So it's something if I wanted to rerun the inversion, it will be really easy to actually change the starting density and to choose a, another one. Uh, same for the lower bounds. I could add more columns with different, uh, more open or more restrictive bounds. It'll be very easy to actually change them uh, if I wanted to uh, test different models. Uh, and here I'll specify uh, the starting value at 2.67 and the top at zero. For the inversion parameters, I need to specify which heterogeneous um, geological units want, uh, I want to uh, be used in that inversion. In that case, we only have the bedrock, but if we had a model that was a bit more complex with uh, several domains, with a mix of homogeneous and heterogeneous domains within that, um, that VP model, I could select which uh, would be the active or inactive heterogeneous unit uh, in that inversion. Uh, I want to run 20 iteration, and I want to run a Ford model every uh, 10 iterations. I will lower a little bit the maximum model perturbation um, to 0 0.15 grams per cc maximum iteration, so the inversion doesn't converge too fast to a, a solution. And, um, and then I'll go and uh, click on apply to uh, run my inversion. So right now we just see the, the progress bar here uh, uh, popping up on the screen. Uh, we'll have a, a lot more information on, on that process and on what happened if we actually go to uh, the console here. And on the console panel, we've got uh, all the kind of the log uh, information from uh, the VPMG code. And we can see that we've achieved uh, the target misfit and uh, we've got 0 0.05 um, AODROS for the RMS uh, at the end. So uh, let's look um, at the results. So I'm going back to the viewport here. And uh, on our model now, I've got a new uh, density, um, density property, which is that HT inversion 267 here. And uh, I'll just adjust a little bit. Uh, the range here between uh, 2.55 uh, and uh, 2.85. Um, there we go. So now we've got our 3D distribution here within the model. Uh, we can look at our data uh, here at top. Um, where we've got here on top view uh, our uh, calculated data from the inversion process and our original data. We can see that there is a quite a, a good match here. And the residual here is uh, in a very narrow range. So it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty good. Uh, if we look at the model itself, uh, there is various ways to actually look at our information here. Uh, we can, um, uh, show uh, a cross section through the model. So here we've got a horizontal uh, section through it. So at 500 meters or at five kilometers. Uh, we can um, move the, the panels here. Uh, we can also uh, bring the ISO, va uh, ISO values. So I'm going to remove that cross section here and I'll bring the ISO, va ISO value onto our inverted property. Uh, between 2.2 uh, uh, grams per cc and 2.6. So here we're really looking at the low density uh, within, uh, within the bedrock unit. And something that's uh, of interest here is that if I bring back our um, geology map from before and the cross section uh, from here, is that we can see there is some correspondence between where these low uh, density 
uh, features are, are located and where uh, we've got gas masking uh, observed into the, uh, the seismic data that were used to generate that, that cross section here. So um, another way to actually uh, look at that and get a better idea between the relationship of the data along that cross section is to actually look uh, at this into the, the 2D viewer. So to do that, uh, I will just uh, resample um, this uh, line representing the cross section. Right now it only has a, a node, uh, like very uh, few nodes. So I'll just resample it um, with a 500 meter uh, resolution here. So I'll densify that curve at a 500 meter resolution here. So we can see now all the, the nodes on that, uh, that new curve. Uh, what I'll do is I'll transfer um, the data from uh, our uh, two kilometer um, gravity points onto that curve. And that's quite, uh, quite powerful here. So uh, the source data are going to be uh, my points here. There we go. Uh, the data, uh, I can use maybe the Bouguet corrected data and uh, Rear the TZZ. There we go. Uh, I will um, transfer that onto um, the densified curve association on the nodes, and I'll do a weighted average here uh, on every eight nodes of the of the curve because of the um, difference in resolution between the 500 meter resolution along the uh, that uh, profile. And, uh, uh, and the two kilometer resolution of the, uh, the data set here. All right, so data have been transferred. So if I now look on that curve, I've got um, our uh, Bouguet corrected data and our original uh, uh, gravity data here. So if I go into the profile viewer here, which is another tab uh, next to the viewport, I'll select my densified curve. There we go. Uh, that densified curve, I can show uh, the vertical component of the tensor here. And uh, in the section view here, I can select our inverted model. And the section that's shown here below is the sampling of our inverted model, the sampling of our 3D density distribution along, um, along the nodes of the curve. So you can see here that sometimes you've got some like wider cells and narrow ones. It just depends on where the nodes are located. But um, what makes this very, uh, very useful is that we can actually um, split the viewport here at top. And zoom in here. And now, uh, if I go back onto uh, the 3D profile viewer here, when I actually select a node on my curve, so when we actually look at where we've got these low density uh, units here, I can actually click on it and see exactly where it's located along the profile. So if I actually hide uh, the model and just look at uh, my cross section here, so I can see where I've got the lithologies on my cross section, and I can actually walk along and check where things are located in relationship to my model. So here we're looking at the vertical component of the tensor. I could actually just add uh, another curve here and I could add um, the Bouguet corrected 2.67 uh, data. If I wanted to, so yeah, it would be like here and a little plateau here. So, um, that kind of like concludes a little bit um, um, this uh, virtual lecture. Um, we've, um, uh, we've shown how to explicitly represent the, uh, the volume of water into, um, into our model and how to actually compute the response of that model and, um, uh, and perform a, a 3D heterogeneous inversion below, uh, below the water. So um, I'll be happy to answer uh, any questions um, that were asked. Great, um, uh, thank you, Thomas. And uh, thank you to anyone who joined us today. And uh, for those that are here today, um, if you have any questions, please 
raise your hand or type them into the Q and A. Um, we'll wait, we'll wait a couple minutes for that. And in case uh, you can't think of them right now, but they'll come up later um, while you're pondering all this info, um, you can always email us at support at marriagescience.com and we would be happy to answer any questions you have. Yeah, we'll see you guys next month when uh, I will be showing what is new in the next version of Geoscience Analyst, which is going to be version 3.4. Um, so we'll see you guys there, November 18th, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. Thanks, everyone.